Audience, welcome to Viewpoint from Overseas. I am your host, Ms. Bazam. With me, my colleague, uh, Mr. Sabahat Ashraf. Sabahat, uh, when we see the Pakistani media, we see a lot of uh, discussions about Pakistan relations with India, Afghanistan, even Bangladesh, and very little we hear about Iran. It is kind of turning very sensitive relations now, especially after recent incidents. So today uh, we have a very appropriate person who can enlighten us and who can educate us about what is going on overall. I mean, he is uh, he served in not only in Iran as an ambassador uh, of Pakistan to Iran, but he also served in UAE, ambassador UAE, then Afghanistan, India. He he worked in Indian embassy also. Than U.S., so he he has a very wide-ranging understanding of that region. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am honored to introduce you uh, His Excellency Ambassador Asif Durrani. He is with us. Uh, hello, Mr. Ambassador. How you are doing today? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baba, for having me. And uh, it's wonderful seeing you all for a long time. Yeah, this is a very interesting thing. I remember uh, in the 80s when Ambassador Durrani was uh, uh, just joined the Foreign Service and I was a young man and I used to listen to him time to time. I used to take his notes and interestingly, sometimes I used to go and uh, argue with Busatullah Khan, you know, nowadays. He's with Don. Busat is on the scene too. Yeah, Busat, Busat is always our old friend and Ambassador Durrani, I'm sure, knows him very well as well. Uh, yes, I know him. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, sure, yeah. Sabat, how about you? Uh, you ask questions right. to Ambassador, so, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, it's actually very timely because as Mr. Sab, as you said, we don't nowadays talk about the Pakistani relationship with Iran because things have been so focused on Afghanistan, on Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. the U.S. However, we do have a historical relationship with Iran and Persia, both in terms of our cultural and historical background and since Pakistan itself came into existence, there's been a relationship mm -hmm. and interestingly, a relationship that spans both the Shah's period and the Islamic the Republic. Islamic Republic. So, I, I, we would like to ask you, Ambassador Saab, that uh, where do you see this is? If uh, Could you also help us understand that context in the historical cultural context and particularly what is going on now? Because what we are seeing at one level for someone like me, we are noticing this axis. In fact, um, a couple of weeks ago on this show, we were discussing, or I, my opinion was it almost seems like the old band that was together during the Afghan Soviet war of Saudi Arabia, Pakistan and the US sort of coordinating uh, or basically having the same push and direction seems to be coming around and in this case seems because especially the US regime right now is very anti-Iran and that is problematic for Iran and Ms. Bas, I was saying we don't talk about Iran but most uh, Pakistanis actually have a soft spot for Iran in their hearts because there's a historical uh, perspective. Where do you see us? How did we get here? Where do you see us right now? Thank you, Sabah. Uh, uh, you have uh, put many questions and I think uh, it will take a little bit of uh, time to explain Please do. all those aspects. Please go uh, ahead, sir. Uh, First, uh, historically, Iran has always been close to Pakistan. Um, we owe it to Iran. Iran was the first country in the world which recognized Pakistan at the UN. And then subsequently, our relationship grew and they grew stronger. Um, we also remember that during 1965 and 71 wars with India, Iran was in the forefront. They supported Pakistan. 
Uh, in fact, Iran has been uh, giving us the strategic depth uh, uh, in geo-military terms. So um, that was there. After the revolution in Iran, uh, there, have, there have been changes. Uh, there have been changes uh, domestically, political changes. Uh, it uh, turned everything upside down. And uh, Iranians, uh, which uh, normally they are Western-oriented, uh, they, they had to face a new phenomenon of the Islamic Revolution. And, uh, but at the same time, there were other forces uh, which also contributed to the change and they were in the forefront uh, against uh, the, the monarchy in Iran, uh, which was ruling uh, uh, Iran um, almost 2,500 years. So it was a big change. Uh, they say that after the Soviet Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, Iranian Revolution was the biggest event uh, taking place in the world, and uh, rightly so. Uh, however, there are uh, upsides and downsides of uh, any revolution. Upside was that, that it uh, actually gave uh, a voice, it gave strength to the lower classes uh, in the Iranian society. Uh, uh, However, um, economically, uh, Iran had to face many difficulties. Despite the fact that Iran is an oil producing country, it is uh, a leading member of the OPEC, it is, uh, its reserves are almost as uh, second in the world in the OPEC countries, although uh, uh, Russia is considered to be the number one oil producing country in the world. Uh, having said that, uh, Iran and Pakistan, they uh, have always enjoyed cordial relations. When I say cordial relations, it doesn't mean that we don't have differences in perceptions. But at the same time, uh, they, both the countries, they have always stood by each other uh, whenever there were difficult situations uh, coming up. Even now, when uh, we talk about uh, the, uh, the changing uh, uh, environment in, in the region, especially in the Middle East region. And then there are talks that perhaps Pakistan may be tilting towards the Saudi Arabia or Saudi-led uh, GCC countries. Uh, I think uh, there is some exaggeration in this thinking because uh, Iran is our direct neighbor. Uh, we uh, share 920 kilometers of borders. We have some common problems uh, arising because of the common borders and also some uh, political issues uh, we face both in uh, Pakistani Baluchistan and Iranian Baluchistan. And then we also face the problem of narcotics which emanates from Afghanistan, but Pakistan and Iran are the transit countries. We face problems uh, of organized crime, uh, with uh, human smuggling. Uh, these are the major issues which we face. Uh, but uh, on the political plane, both the countries they have an uh, ideal relationship. On the uh, when, whenever you talk about a relationship between the two countries, there are four major aspects. One is political, the other one is cultural, and the third one is commercial or trade, and the last one is the defense. When you look at all these aspects, there are varying degrees of cooperation going on between uh, the two countries. I can uh, narrate one by one, uh, but I think uh, I'll leave it to you uh, when uh, you think that there may be certain other questions. But to sum it up, I can say that uh, the relationship between the two countries are stable. There, yes, of late there have been some issues with that we can discuss if there are any, you know, individual incidents which uh, of late the Iranian uh, um, Officials uh, uh, have issued harsh statement on right. the killing of 40, uh, 27 uh, IRGC uh, personnel uh, in Zahida. Uh, the area of incident was almost 110 kilometers away from Pakistani border. Iranian authorities blame that Jesh Adil uh, is a Pakistan-based organization whose uh, uh, members are uh, Iranian Baloch, but they are taking shelter in Pakistan and they have perpetrated these, uh, this crime. Uh, our interpretation is slightly different. We say that uh, Baloch on both sides of the border, under the Eastman tribe, they straddled 
They straddle 60 kilometers on each side uh, uh, under special permits. And then there's a problem. There's a problem of deprivation in Iran and Balochistan. And uh, that is causing unrest, uh, that is especially causing unrest among the youth. They think they are underrepresented in their uh, uh, political institutions and, and their and civil and military bureaucracies, in their economic affairs. So therefore, these are the issues which need to be addressed by the Iranian authorities uh, because it is also serious for us. Uh, we also know for sure that uh, some of our Baloch dissidents from our Balochistan have been taking shelter in the Iran and Balochistan. Uh, uh, and we have been raising this issue with the Iranian officials. So, uh, similarly, after the Iranian revolution, uh, uh, this uh, Shia Sunni uh, issue, although, thank God, it's not that serious in Pakistan, but nevertheless, it started in Pakistan. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember vividly that uh, there was no problem uh, of Shia Sunni in Pakistan ever before the Iranian revolution. But we, during the past four decades, there have been uh, issues here and there, incidents here and there. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, uh, all successive governments in Pakistan have succeeded in uh, controlling uh, that menace which certain vested interests wanted to uh, create in Pakistan. They wanted to create uh, sectarian divide. Uh, they may, they, they may be certain uh, elements uh, who are perhaps just to play politics. They want to uh, continue with uh, that policies, whether it, those are Sunnis or the Shias. Mm -hmm. But at the popular level, thank God, thank God, this is uh, not the case, and that shows the majority of the people of Pakistan that they live like brothers. Nevertheless. Uh, Iranian revolution had a contribution into that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I leave it at that, and then uh, if there are questions, then I'll be happy to answer. <laughs> Uh, Sabah, do you have any follow-up question? No, I, I specifically, you mentioned, uh, Brother Saab, the recent uh, statements that went back and forth. I mean, the statements themselves were what they were. But does that is that reflective of a deeper uh, tension between the two or uh, divergence? Could you help us unpack what exactly happened there? I mean, you mentioned, of course, that we both have complaints about decisions almost sounds like the Kurdish issue in, in the Middle East where everyone has their own minority that they have a problem with and then the, in the neighboring country they uh, and they accuse the neighbors of uh, supporting F people from the same minority in different countries. So that is I guess a given but what exactly is going on right now and how does Afghanistan factor into that? Well, uh, <clears throat> With regard to Iran and Pakistan, I don't think that it's very serious. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's serious to the extent that we cannot ignore the problem because right. if we keep on ignoring it, then it can uh, blow up. Uh, but uh, uh, luckily, that the, the aspect is being uh, looked into by our uh, authorities as well. And I may also add here that. Uh, in, in the past two years, uh, Pakistan has uh, established a southern command of the frontier uh, core uh, mm -hmm. along the Iranian border. Earlier, we okay. never had our troops along the Iranian border because we had full confidence in the, uh, in the in the security situation. However, at the request of the Iranian authorities, we have put up uh, our uh, uh, FC southern uh, southern command, which is headed by uh, Alert, uh, Major General. This has made a difference, and uh, even Iranian officials, high, at the highest level, they have acknowledged uh, the improvement of the situation around the borders. Uh, but uh, let me tell you that uh, the major part of this problem is from the organized crimes, rather than uh, crimes relating to terrorism or mm -hmm. crimes relating to, to uh, political issues. Uh, okay. Organized crime, when I say it, 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 it it includes uh, drug trafficking, it includes right. human smuggling, it's, uh, it includes normal smuggling. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, other issues are uh, very far in Cuba because uh, in the past uh, one year, this was the one incident, one uh, I can recall, uh, plus uh, another 12 uh, Iranian uh, <laughs> IRGC personnel who were abducted. Uh, of which uh, eight have been recovered uh, in our Balochistan and those have been uh, handed over to the Iranian authorities.
parties. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but in the, at the regional level, yes, uh, there are complaints that uh, Iran has been uh, instigating some regional countries. Uh, uh, they have been instigating the Shia population, or they have been actually complaining that uh, Shias have not been given the due uh, uh, share in governance. Uh, uh, so, giving due uh, share in governance is a problem, and the same problem also exists in the Iran and Baluchistan. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so Mr. Ambassador, uh, there is a little problem uh, here uh, that when we see the the overall region, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Iran, you know, there is an involvement of India and Iran uh, relations. There is uh, Afghanistan and Iran. I mean, it, both Afghanistan and India Pakistan sees very differently than Iran see them, if, if I, I, I were to understand it correctly. So how this, uh, this all different kind of situation, how Pakistan as a, you know, like a country surrounded by uh, almost every country other than China, which is not a friendly country, I would not say enemy. Why? How you see it? Uh, what Pakistan can do to reduce at least one unfriendly neighbor? Uh, of course, with Afghanistan, uh, it will take long time. It has a history, but Iran, Pakistan had a very, very different history. So, what Pakistan can do to have at least uh, one of the unfriendly neighbor? become a friendly neighbor and did Pakistan, is Pakistan uh, able to do anything because of its uh, bad economic situations, its uh, reliance on Saudi Arabia and then a big part of uh, those people who are controlling the streets in Pakistan and even in the media, there is a special support for Saudi Arabia. So. How you see all that? And uh, one more point I would like to add with that, that even not only those people who control the street, but when Irani president came during the time of uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, there was an incident where there is a discussion and then the DGISPR sent a tweet and said something which he denied. So under this scenario, how Pakistan can proceed? to have some better relations with Iran? I think let's uh, do the things in chronological order. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. Pakistan has an adversarial relationship uh, with India since its birth. Right. Of course. And uh, with Afghanistan, we had irritant that Afghanistan first refused to recognize Pakistan at the UN, but subsequently it did. And then uh, Afghanistan was uh, uh, pushing the bogey of uh, Pashtunistan, which it did till the mid 70s. But once uh, the communists came there, and uh, then uh, the Soviets, we did not invite the Soviets to Afghanistan. We did not invite the refugees, mm -hmm. Afghan refugees, into Pakistan. So Pakistan cannot be blamed for what happened. Sure. Right. inside Afghanistan, but rather Pakistan had to face the collateral damage right. because of the situation in Afghanistan. Pakistan was not the reason of the Iranian revolution, uh, uh, so we have to be clear about that. Yes. Pakistan never had the Shia Sunni problem, uh, so, we, so here we cannot blame Pakistan for not having good relationship with India or for that matter what situation and the instabilities in Afghanistan have been taking. And then those uh, warring factions inside Afghanistan, they have been looking for uh, allies far afield, whether sometimes siding with India or sometimes siding with uh, Pakistan or elsewhere, including Iran. Right. So Afghanistan has been in turmoil and it, its warring factions have been looking for allies far afield, and this is what is happening. With regard to direct Iran, with Iran, we don't uh, have direct uh, confrontation or any irritant which we can say may turn into a very serious, serious issue. 
these uh, border incidents are because of the certain problems which are uh, which Iranians uh, will have to address in any case. In that we uh, we as far as our actions are concerned, those Jaish uh, uh, elements who have been taking shelter, we have got hold of them and are. Uh, 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 you can say performance in this regard has been uh, substantive and uh, Iranians have also acknowledged that. There is not a single pending case where Iranians can say that such a such person is uh, uh, roaming around in Pakistan uh, and they are taking shelter. So I can also show you on that. However, uh, the geographical, uh, uh, I mean geopolitical situation in the region itself uh, has been in turmoil, uh, especially because of Afghanistan. So uh, we are the victim of what happened in our neighborhood and uh, uh, it uh, directly and indirectly impacted us. So therefore we have to uh, uh, tread with care, we have to tread all these through these minefields with, uh, with, with care. And which Pakistan is doing uh, under the circumstances and uh, because of the new political situation in the region. Uh, there is no cause for worry for you on that count. The cause for worry is the overall uh, situation uh, obtaining in the Middle East and North Africa region. If you look at uh, the geopolitical map of the world, the uh, main problem you find in the Muslim world and that too uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, MENA region which is called. And since we happen to be uh, in the neighborhood of Middle East, uh, we are on the convergence of that uh, region, so uh, we will be impacted. And let me tell you that uh, you had uh, referred to our tilt uh, towards the, or uh, they are dependent on Saudi Arabia, let me correct it, that Pakistan is not dependent on any any countries including Saudi Arabia and all that. We have our, we may have our problems, economic problems, but that doesn't mean that we have sold our soul uh, to the devil. That's not the case. Uh, let's be very clear about that. Yeah, and and we, have, we may have our economic problems, so those problems are faced everywhere have been faced by all, all the countries of the world, including the most powerful nation, the United States, right. which yeah. owes uh, $2.5 trillion to the Chinese alone. Yes. So uh, the, those uh, economic problems do uh, come and go, but the uh, actual thing is that what kind of policies are we pursuing right. uh, in the region? So as I have uh, told you, that with India we have unfortunate uh, situation uh, from the day one. But uh, yes. Afghanistan situation, we did not create that. Uh, and uh, Iran, Iran revolution, we have uh, zero contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, but we yes. had to react to certain developments which were taking place. Overall, with Iran, we have had a very good relationship, and both the countries have stood by each other. It is not a one-way traffic. So uh, I can't say that Iranians have not stood by Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They have stood by. Pakistan. I have. Yes. And Iranians cannot say that we have not stood by Iran. So right. I think uh, on the balance, uh, this is a similar relationship, uh, which I can say. So th just, just, uh, uh, Ryan Sam, just to uh, finish that thought, because you mentioned, and uh, we were going to get there, the geopolitical situation, because especially in the U.S., there's a lot of talk about what's happening in Yemen, where Iran is involved, Saudi Arabia is involved, and like you said, we, uh, whatever has happened, we've always had good solid relationships with both Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, if with Iran, despite the regime change, we've always been good. Saudi Arabia has been, you know, a close relationship of, I mean, we've had close and closer relationships at various times. So uh, how do you see that role of how well Pakistan is being able to navigate that issue of staying out or not being involved or even maybe uh, to get more uh, sort of idealistic, is there a role for Pakistan to help resolve that whole thing? I mean, what's, how are we playing? Because Pakistan is one of the largest Muslim countries in the world. It, it should have a role in navigating or helping mediate some of these things, shouldn't it? Uh, being the second largest Muslim country in the world after Indonesia, Pakistan has a role and that role is 
than we do it. We should not be taking sides, and this is what yeah. Pakistan has been doing so far. Having individual relationship with the countries uh, is a sovereign right which every uh, nation or which every Muslim country is having. Even there are certain Muslim countries uh, which are having a direct relationship with Israel. Yeah. That doesn't mean that Pakistan will not have a relationship with those countries. We have uh, our relationship uh, with Yemen as well, and, uh, and and you might be knowing that that Pakistan uh, announced its neutrality in the Yemen right. uh, yes. situation. Reason was that uh, uh, we should, rather than becoming the part of a war machine, we should try to calm the things down. When it came to Iran and Saudi Arabia TIF, uh, it was uh, prudent that uh, we should, being in the neighborhood, we, if we had taken uh, sides, then that would have uh, much more disastrous uh, consequences than right. uh, maintaining a neutral stance. And that uh, policy has given its dividends and it has been proven right that now Pakistan can rightly play a, a role of a mediator between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It did try. Uh, and, um, of course, there, there hasn't been a success so far, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the success uh, will not come. Mm -hmm. uh, one has to remain optimistic. Pakistan, uh, uh, Pakistan's role as a Muslim country would always be my, I mean, it's my personal view, and I think uh, this has been the case so far, is uh, that we should play the role of a mediator if there is uh, any dispute between the Muslim countries. Our policy is that the Muslim countries or other countries, they should resolve their disputes through peaceful means, through dialogue. And this is what we are continuing with the policy. Uh, despite the fact that we are the victims in our uh, own neighborhood uh, along our eastern borders and also because of Afghanistan, we have been um, victims uh, um, first uh, uh, because of the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan and then after 9-11, the mm -hmm. you all know how the situation mm -hmm. has evolved. So I think uh, uh, Pakistan is playing under the limited resources and under the given circumstances its positive role uh, within the Muslim world. And I think it should continue to play that role. Of course, uh, uh, individually I, I cannot go into that because uh, whatever sensitivities are involved, so we have to respect that. Over to you, sir. Uh, so, Sabat, uh, we have like five minutes uh, left for our show. So, I would like to ask uh, M Mr. Ambassador about the India-Pakistan right. relationship. Uh, uh, how, uh, Mr. Ambassador, how you see India-Pakistan relationships are heading at? Kartarpur meeting was cancelled and uh, elections are there, still there is time to time, the saber rattling going on, not from our side, but from their side. So how you see where it is heading at, and there is a cliche now in the media, among the political figures, that okay, yeah, election will be over, then everything will be hunky-dory. Do you really see all that? Well, I can't say that things would be hunky-dory, but I think, uh, uh, this is what uh, the common wisdom says that, uh, and uh, as a footnote, a footnote, let me tell you that uh, now an interesting uh, situation has emerged as far as the Indian election scene is concerned. In, during the past few uh, elections, which uh, one witnesses that uh, Pakistan has become a whipping boy uh, on both sides or all sides, especially by the ruling parties, mm -hmm. they, they whip Pakistan. Uh, while this uh, India is uh, never an issue in Pakistan uh, during our elections, uh, you just uh, you you look at the archives uh, of our last uh, last year's elections or elections in 2013. India was non-existent. Uh, India was a non-issue. But why Pakistan has been made an issue uh, to this proportion is uh, something uh, very strange. Uh, and uh, let me also tell you that uh, uh, 
uh, India and Pakistan, unfortunately, uh, now uh, the situation has come to such a pass that uh, Mr. Modi has uh, tried to uh, uh, raise the temperatures, uh, which are which is very dangerous. And uh, uh, if he thinks that he can create a new normal in um, India-Pakistan relationship by uh, involving militaries and then uh, then crossing the red lines then i think uh, he is playing with fire mm -hmm. and uh, or any subsequent indian government if they think that they can uh, ratchet up things uh, and okay. take it to the military level mm -hmm. then again uh, for the two nuclear weapon states this situation should not emerge even pin breaks are not allowed so therefore, the, the best thing is that they should talk, I and mean, um, this is uh, the only uh, remedy available. Uh, if they want to go for other options, uh, for the kinetic options, for the military options, then uh, I think they should be ready for the disasters. Both sides should be ready for the disasters. And in, uh, in being nuclear weapon states, there will be no victory. So that, would, that is called Pyrrhic victory. So they will only have a Pyrrhic victory, which uh, we should uh, avoid. And we should also, in fact, sensitize our uh, people that uh, what are the, the consequences of a nuclear conflagration, God forbid, if it takes place, if yeah. it happens. Uh, I'm afraid that neither in Pakistan or in India uh, there is uh, any attempt to uh, sensitize the people about the, 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 the disastrous consequences of uh, of, of uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, nuclear weapons is is uh, not a weapon of choice. But uh, when the countries they uh, take these kind of uh, when they go for these options. Even for the conventional military forces, and if they happen to be nuclear weapon state, it's very dangerous. And uh, mind you, this ex-Soviet Union and uh, United States, they never had direct uh, confrontation. Uh, they, they played proxies, but they never went for a direct confrontation. Yes. So I think India and Pakistan should learn that lesson. I'll leave it there. Okay, sir. <laughs> Uh, you have something. Okay, no, I, I was just wondering uh, one last thing on that is do, do you see a role for uh, we were discussing Iran and we saw the recent visit from the Saudi uh, crown prince where he went to Pakistan and then he went to India. Do you see a role or any hope in these third parties and common friends, so to speak, uh, getting involved to some extent and more regional uh, because historically it's been the US that has stepped in. But now we are seeing that, you know, Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Iran itself has pretty good relationships with India. Is there a role for any of that or is there any hope I, there? I mean, uh, from Pakistan side, uh, we have always welcomed uh, any, any mediatory role. Uh, but I think it was always India which has opposed such a role. And they say that the uh, dispute should resolve by the two countries bilaterally. But uh, unfortunately, India has not been forthcoming in resolving the dispute bilaterally as well. So uh, therefore, there were still made. Uh, so I think uh, India will have to decide what kind of a relationship they want to have with Pakistan. They cannot wish away Pakistan. They cannot wish away the Kashmir dispute and right. its resolution. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, whatever the policies they want to adopt towards Pakistan, I think Pakistan will be uh, we'll be ready to respond in the same point. So, uh, Sabat, it was a, uh, Mr. Ambassador, it was a very nice discussion with you and we would be hoping that you will provide us opportunity to keep in touch with you in coming days because we have a lot to talk to you regarding Afghanistan and uh, US policy because you are just hands-on type of person. We use this word in our engineering <laughs> terminologies. So, when, so we will be with you. So, Sabat, you have any kind of uh, uh, question or any kind no, of I think comment? Just, as a final comment is, it's good to hear someone who's been involved on that side and getting the, because often we get excited about these uh, slight changes in wind winds and that view that you provide of, of going into that bigger picture, the relationships, 
Iran, as you mentioned, has a, a very historical relationship with us, and and that's how it is. So again, as Nizam said, we look forward to talking to you about uh, some of the nitty gritty of it as it unfolds, especially you know in the run up to the Indian election. After that, there's uh, actually one very quick. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Last go ahead. item is yeah. especially because you are from the Foreign Office. This recent spats that we've had between the. Afghan government and Mr. Imran Khan, where he made a comment on uh, what kind of government or what government Afghanistan should have. Does that seem out of character to you, or what was your personal reaction to that whole spat? I think that was a misreporting. Uh, really? It, but first started from the newspapers because there were different reports from the newspapers. There was not a single one. And Prime Minister's remarks uh, were misinterpreted, to which uh, Foreign Office uh, had to issue a clarification the next right. day. But uh, our, our, our friends, uh, they, are, they became emotional and they, they in fact, uh, they recalled their uh, Basel for consultations. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that they have recalled, they have recalled for consultations and mm -hmm. hopefully yes. things would settle down and I think the things are settling down. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's just so, <laughs> so thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was our show for today. Uh, keep watching Viewpoint from Overseas. I am your host, Ms. Ba Azam. Thank you and good day.